In this lecture, we'll be looking at Marius, Saturninus, and the Social War. We'll start off by looking at Saturninus's social reforms and their impact on Marius's career, and then turn to the challenges of managing Rome's expanding empire. So Saturninus is perhaps best described as Marius's enforcer. He was an activist tribune on the model of the Gracchi brothers and was responsible for helping Marius to arrange land grants for veterans of the Jugurthine War and the war against the Germanic tribes. So really Saturninus was Marius's ally when Marius was consul. But Saturninus had his own agenda that went beyond just serving as Marius's enforcer. And this was a, an incredibly um, socialist agenda. It was populist. It was very much about being a man of the people and probably on some level cultivating his own fame, his own reputation. In particular, he was interested in founding colonies and in allocating land to veterans in Greece, Sicily, and Gaul. So in taking over land that was in large part controlled by the Roman state and returning that land to the Roman people, allocating that land to the Roman people. Um, an image of Saturninus on a coin is preserved for us and this is shown on the left hand side of your screen. So Saturninus proposed a number of different popular reforms, and particularly these proposals um, for land reform, for land distribution. But there was a lot of resistance, as we've seen there always is. Um, he's very much a, an activist tribune, and these activist tribunes encountered resistance not just from the senatorial aristocracy, but from other tribunes even. And the same was true for Saturninus. But he's able to really ram through his proposals in a pretty dicey way. Um, he gets Marius's veterans to stand guard at the elections and to keep out hostile voters. So really, um, you know, we have tampering with elections um, is Saturninus's strategy for getting his proposals through the, the citizens' assembly, um, through the, the, the assembly of the tribunes. Marius also, at this time, grants the right of citizenship to a small number of people living in veteran colonies. So some of the colonies now that are being founded, these are not just transposing people that were just Roman citizens who need a new start, but in fact, they're, they're what are known as veterans colonies. So they're, they're composed entirely of veterans who are resettled abroad and given land to cultivate. Um, but of course, as colonists, they don't have the rights of citizenship. And the Romans, by this point in time, are getting stingy about who gets citizenship. And there's a lot of tensions about giving grants of citizenship writ large. Um, but Marius is able to grant it to a small number of these veteran colonists. In 99, Saturninus is re-elected Tribune of the Plebs, um, an indication that however much um, people may not have liked his strong-arm tactics and the, however much resistance he encountered from the elite, that he still had a strong base of support among the masses and perhaps even among elites who had a more populist outlook. Um, but Saturninus sort of takes a, an additional turn downward when he attempts to have his own candidate for consul elected. So Marius now um, has ended his run of consulships, but Saturninus has a new guy that he wants um, to have in office who's really going to be his partner in the Senate, um, Glaucia. Um, the problem is that Glaucia doesn't meet, the legal hasn't, doesn't meet the legal qualifications for consul. Now, this wasn't always a problem, but in this case, it was. Um, so Saturninus first tries to have the law change. That's an, a, an obvious way to get around the issue. Um, he then has his followers beat a rival candidate for consul to death. So what we see here is really an exacerbation of the violence that was already being shown when he has Marius' veterans keep hostile voters out of an election. Um, now he's upped it um, to murder. And it's, again, an instance of 
this violence in Roman politics that's going to come to permeate the first century. Um, and we'll be returning to this theme a number of times. It becomes really evident with the, the Gracchi brothers um, when Tiberius is beaten to death and then when um, um, Gaius is also forced to kill himself. Um, but now we get a reemergence of violence being used as a political tool. The Senate responds to Saturninus's turn to violence by issuing a Senatus Consultum, consultum Ultimum, an SCU, against him, and on the grounds that he is an enemy of the state, he, he threatens the security of the state, and that all means must be used to protect the safety of the state. So this is a real turn of events, and it puts Marius in a very uncomfortable position. He's now forced to really pick sides. Um, Saturninus forces Marius' hand and puts Marius in a position where he can't really support Saturninus anymore without serious damage to his own political legacy, which Marius, having worked so hard to reach the consulship um, as a new man, is not willing to do. So eventually what Marius does is have Saturninus and his supporters arrested and he imprisons them in the Senate House. Part of what he's trying to do here, it seems, is buy time, um, trying to figure out what way to go. He's not eager to put Saturninus and these other citizens to death, um, but he's not sure that he also wants to look the other way and be subject to accusations of complicity in this murder. Eventually, the, the issue is taken out of his hands entirely when a lynch mob breaks into the Senate House and kills the entire group. So Saturninus and his followers are all murdered. This is entirely legal. Um, they, the Senate's SCU makes it legal. Normally, you can't kill a Roman citizen without a trial, but when the Senate issues an SCU, any, it's a state of emergency, essentially. It's a declaration that the everything needs to be done to protect the Roman state, and murder is no problem. Some of the things that we see, though, coming to the fore through this episode with Saturninus and Marius is, again, sort of the power of elected officials to use mob violence to achieve their aims. This will not be the last time that we see this, and in fact, throughout the first century, it's going to be a real problem. We also see the role of veterans, and particularly the manipulation of veterans. This, again, is a, a recurrent theme in first century politics. Effectively, this episode with Saturninus marks the end of Marius's political career. Um, he's not re-elected consul, and it seems that he's going to go off into retirement. As we'll see, things don't end quite that way for Marius, but for now, we can, we can say that we've seen the end of Marius' political career in 99. So the other issue that we need to talk about as we start to enter the first century BC is the issue of provincial management. Um, as Rome continues to expand through its military efforts, there is this ongoing issue of how to manage this new territory. Um, we've talked a little bit about the ways that new territory would be broken up into provinces and the rule of these provinces would sometimes be given to elected officials. Eventually, um, a different system evolves, um, a system of governors. But it's in this period, beginning in the second century BC, but certainly in the first century, that we see the clear evolution of a system, a rationale, of provincial management. The first thing we have to talk about is what's called the Lex Provinciae, or the law of the province. Um, what this was, was a law, a, a written code, that defined the province's individual relationship to Rome. Um, it defined its laws, and it defined its tax obligations. And these would vary from province to province, and to some degree it varied from how close the particular province was to Rome itself. So there are provinces in Italy, but also provinces around the Mediterranean. So we talked about Transalp Transalpine Gaul um, across the Alps, Gaul. 
There's also Cisalpine Gaul on the, the Italian side of the Alps Gaul. Um, there are provinces, is, provinces now in Africa and provinces in Spain as well. Um, Sicily, Sardinia, so around the Mediterranean. And they'll also expand into the Eastern Mediterranean during this time. But each of these provinces has its own unique relationship to Rome, its own set of laws. The province is generally ruled now by a governor. The governor is given supreme power within the province, and he names a group of legates to come with him. Legate, the legates were usually drawn from the Roman aristocracy. They were people who had a close relationship to the governor. They didn't have to be aristocrats, but they were people that he trusted and that he wanted to give a leg up. This, this was a, a great privilege um, to serve as a legate to a governor. Um, the other official that would serve in a province was the quaestor. So the quaestorship is the first rung on the cursus honorum. And one of the major activities that the quaestor did was go serve in a province under a governor and look after Rome's financial interests in that province. A major issue in the management of provinces, though, is exploitation, um, exploitation of the local inhabitants. And this was something that was absolutely fueled by the debts that were incurred by the increasingly expensive runs for office. So in order to advance on the cursus honorum, a candidate had to stand for office. Um, oftentimes this meant bribing people to vote for you. It meant spending your own money to negotiate different coalitions, but it was an extremely costly endeavor. It's partly why it was so difficult for a new man to enter onto the cursus honorum in any other way except through extreme military accomplishment, um, as Marius did. But for somebody just coming from a town like Arpinum outside of, outside of Rome, it was really unlikely that you were going to have the financial resources to enter onto the cursus honorum and to be able to sustain a career. It, each time you served in an office, you had to run for the next office and the next office until you reached the consulship. So by the time somebody was elected consul, very often they were in huge debt. And in essence, the incentive for achieving high office was the promise that you would serve as a governor in a province somewhere, and hopefully in a really rich province, in one where there was a lot of money to exploit. Um, so it, there was just a huge incentive to exploit the provinces. And we'll see as we get into the empire that, in fact, an emperor like Trajan could position himself as somebody who had a, had a beneficent relationship to the provinces. He was a protector. He was a father. Well, part of why he's able to do this is that so many of his predecessors had been exploitative of the provinces. The pr local provincials had very few resources, um, very few protections. Roman law, while it applied to them, very, very often wasn't enforced. So they could sue somebody or they could try to seek redress through the legal system, but then it meant that that official was being tried by a jury of his peers um, who often let him go scot-free. So it was very difficult for an exploited provincial to see any kind of recompense for that exploitation. An important player in the management of the provinces are the publicani. Um, these are the private contractors. Um, they did a couple of major things in the provinces. Um, they oversaw building projects. So, you know, this was the equivalent of hiring a general contractor to manage the construction of a building or the renovation of your house for that matter. But one of the things that the, the publicani did was oversee public building projects. They also bid on the right to collect taxes from provincials. This was an enormous upfront gamble that you would, you would pay a sum of money in an auction on the assumption that you could reclaim at least that much money in the tax collection process. Now, there wasn't an IRS. It meant knocking door to door and collecting the taxes individually. It meant having a huge conglomerate of people working for you. 
um, making sure that there w nobody was skimming the profit. So it's it's a, an enormous undertaking and risky. Um, very not very often, but it did happen that the Publicani would bid on a contract. So a syndicate would win a contract and then not be able to collect anywhere near what they had bid and sometimes not even be able to pay the bid. Now, what they really tried to do was underbid, get the contract, and then collect money at a higher rate. Um, and so, again, the system of tax collection was open to abuse, as you can imagine. These, these syndicates were vast, um, and they were a complicated presence. Um, they were necessary. They, the Roman provincial management wouldn't have worked without them. The, the Roman government, the Roman bureaucracy didn't have the manpower to collect the taxes itself. It would have required the creation of the equ equivalent of an ancient IRS and a, a huge um, kind of support system to manage it. It was much easier to outsource the tax collection to a contractor. But it meant that provincial governors and Roman Senate, the Roman Senate, had to walk a pretty careful line. Um, and the Roman Senate had to walk a pretty careful line with those provincial governors, where it, the Senate didn't want to seem like it was aiding exploitation. Um, and provincial governors didn't want to seem that way either. But at the same time, there was this concern about staying on the good side of the Publicani and making sure that they reclaimed what they bid. So it's a real problem, and very frequently governors find themselves, even, even sort of good governors, good governors who are not exploiting the people they are governing, find themselves in difficult positions because of the exploitations of these, these syndicates. Um, as I said, the Senate was very reluctant to punish any sort of abuse. Um, it really tried to stay out of the management of provinces as much as possible. It very frequently looked the other way, even though it's increasingly common for governors and other officials in the provinces to be brought up on charges when they return, um, not because necessarily they were bad managers, but just it's an effective tool of attacking your enemy. And we'll see how this plays out in the case of Julius Caesar um, down the line. But the Senate at this point in the early first century is trying very hard to leave the management of provinces to others and to stay out of the, the punishment business. 91 to 87, we have a war, um, what's called the Social War, the War of the Allies. This is the first full-scale civil conflict in Italy, and it will usher in a long stretch of civil wars that really doesn't come to a close until Augustus defeats Antony and Cleopatra at Actium. But this is kind of the start of that, that period of civil war where we have Roman citizens fighting against other Roman citizens. The major issue was citizenship and connected to that the right to run for political office. So if you're not a citizen, you don't have any rights of participation in Roman government. And again, this becomes an increasing issue when you're not too far from Rome, when you're interested in making a career for yourself, um, when maybe the opportunities at home aren't so great. And it's particularly cities in the central and, and um, eastern Apennines that are most vociferous um, in launching this social war. One thing to keep in mind, though, is a lot of cities did not join up or joined up very briefly and only at the beginning, in particular in the north, um, in, in Etruria, not very many Latin cities, as well as in central Campania. So it was a relatively limited um, participation, but what we're seeing is it's particularly cities where they feel like their best bet is to be able to make a career in Rome, and that right is being denied to them. The, the Allies establish a new capital in a town called Corfinum. This is east of Rome and on the Adriatic coast, so kind of in the central area um, of the rebelling cities, and they dig in. There's not a whole lot of hope that this is going to be successful, but they catch Rome by surprise. 
And, you know, it's important to keep in mind that Rome has just finished in the last couple of decades dealing with Numidia, dealing with conflicts in Gaul. So to now have to deal with a conflict at home is a bit frustrating for the Romans. They would like for to enjoy a period of peace, but it's clear that their Italic allies, um, these, these allied cities, are agitating for full citizenship rights. We also see the extent to which, again, Rome is, is not so eager to extend those citizenship, citizenship rights at this point in time, particularly because they don't want the competition for political office. So at the end of the day, despite some initial successes in the early years, the rebels are outgunned. Um, Rome gathers its forces and is able to quell the rebellion. It's clear that the rebels aren't going to last if they, if they insist on continuing. But they're successful enough, um, they have enough leverage that they're able to force Rome to take action. And in particular, to extend citizenship widely to cities in Italy and in Gaul that are loyal to Rome. And this is a huge issue. And as we'll see throughout the first century, the implications, the consequences of this extension of citizenship play a key role in political strife. So we'll be returning to this at several points um, in subsequent lectures. In the aftermath of the social war, we see the transition now of independent communities in Italy and Gaul to becoming Roman municipia, so being these full Roman, what are, we might call suburbs, um, cities that have full citizenship rights, full voting rights. Um, they're Roman without being in Rome. So cities around Italy and Gaul that had once been independent and had their own culture, um, despite being allies of Rome, now really are becoming less independent. They're dependent on Rome, they're municipia. And they start to lose that, that individual culture that they had had for centuries. It's in this period that we have the unification of Italy. Um, it's, it's what comes to be known in the first century as Tota Italia. And this will usher in then a lot of discussions about Italy versus Rome and the tensions between these two. So you have on the one hand unified Italy of which Rome is the capital, the head, but involves lots of cities. And then on the other hand you have sort of Rome itself standing out um, and trying to figure out a way to balance the interests of Rome with the interests of all Italy, Tota Italia. But it's finally now that we have what we might call the unification um, of Italy. Of course, the result of this extension of citizenship, as the elites knew, is increased competition for political offices. Um, this is a not a bad thing. This is a good thing in general. It's perhaps bad for long-standing noble families who now have to compete even more, have to spend even more money, have to be even better. But it does mean that the talent pool is refreshed, that a lot of new talent is coming into Rome, and it's a period of great cultural growth for Rome because of this unification. Um, but it also means that during elections, we get a much more factionalized voting citizenry and that candidates start to appeal to these different factions and we get warfare, we get gang warfare between these different factions. And so ancient historians like Sallust will talk about the first century BC as factionalized. Um, and what they mean by that is just that it's, it's deeply divided by these interest groups, um, these factions. It's also in the first century BC that finally Latin becomes the lingua franca. Um, it becomes the national language. The downside of this then is the disappearance of regional dialects, uh, many of them that were derived from Greek rather than from Latin, um, but also some dialects that are derived from Latin. But we see now these dialects falling out of use. They're not preserved for us except occasionally in inscriptions. And so they're really entirely lost to us is a written culture um, around Italy. Um, we just have, we know nothing about it really. And Latin 
becomes the dominant language. Um, people speak Latin and they write in Latin. If you want to make a career for yourself as, a, as an author, you have to write in Latin.